All right. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome to tonight's Indivisible Town Hall. I am Stephen Cox. I host the Washington State Indivisible podcast. Uh, I want to start with a huge thanks to you, Kat, with uh, the Washington Indivisible Network, and of course, Julie Andrzejewski with Indivisible Tacoma. Also helping us out tonight is Chris Petzold. And uh, a big thanks to everybody for joining us tonight. This is uh, just a wonderful, wonderful turnout. Uh, so we are very excited to be talking tonight with a couple of terrific uh, progressive candidates, Representative Gail Tarleton and Representative Mike Palachotti. Uh, they are running for Se Secretary of State and Treasurer, respectively. Uh, we're especially excited because both are strong progressives and could potentially control our state's purse and oversee our elections. So here is how tonight is gonna work. We will hear uh, briefly from both candidates. We'll give them a chance to introduce themselves, hear about why they're running, and then we will open things up to all of you so that you can ask questions. The goal here is to give everybody the opportunity to get to know these candidates and to interact with them. Uh, because for obvious reasons, we can't have an actual town hall. We're hoping that this format will give you some of the same access. Uh, so please use the chat bar for your questions. Those will be forwarded to me and we will try to get to as many as possible. And so with that, uh, we will introduce our candidates. Gail Tarleton is state representative for the 36th legislative district, which includes the Magnolia, Ballard, and Queen Anne neighborhoods in Seattle. And she is running for secretary of state. Representative, uh, representative Tarleton, it is so good to talk to you again. Welcome. Good to hear from you, Stefan. Good to see you. Good to see all of you. I can't have everyone on the screen at once, but I am delighted that uh, Indivisible and all of the team have been able to put together this town hall for me and for Representative Pellicciotti. I know that I believe both of us would much prefer to be seeing you all in person, in your home parts of the state, and, uh, and we will do that when it's safe and when our governor, who's leading us through this crisis, uh, tells us it's good to roam around the state. I am running for Secretary of State. And uh, actually, I'm gonna, I if, if, if I could, I'm just gonna introduce uh, Representative Pellicciotti oh, briefly, and then I, I would love to open it up to you. You bet. So, yeah. So also with us is uh, Representative Mike Pellicciotti. He represents the 30th Legislative District, which covers Federal Way, Des Moines, and Auburn, and he's running for Treasurer. Welcome to you, Representative Pellicciotti. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Stefan. It's great to be here. And don't, don't forget about uh, Milton and Pacific as well. Uh, I, yes. will <laughs> I will not. I will not. I would be remiss. So thank they, you for uh, that, that correcting points. me on that. Yes, they, they would yeah. definitely remind you of that as well. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and especially remember the S in Des Moines, right? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so Representative Talton, let's uh, absolutely give you the floor here. So I just want to introduce you by way of saying that you have an extraordinary background by any measure. You started your career with the Defense Intelligence Agency in D.C. You worked at the University of Washington as Director of Corporate and Foundation Relations. You were the Seattle Port Commissioner. Uh, I'm not going to ask you to run down your whole CV, Thanks. but I will just ask you to uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and why you're running for Secretary of State. Uh, thanks very much for the brief bio. And Steph and I, uh, I am running for Secretary of State precisely because of my background. I have decades of experience working on very serious national security issues, dealing with threats to our nation and to our communities. I was a port commissioner when the uh, Great Recession hit, and we lost, you know, 750,000 jobs in this state. And so this crisis that we are going through right now is yet another experience of a crisis ca which can disrupt our way of life, especially disrupt our ability to conduct elections. And boy, haven't we been seeing that around the country. I actually made the decision to run a statewide race against a two-term incumbent last December because I knew that we were not having enough attention paid to how we protect our right to vote, how we secure our elections against any kind of interference, foreign or domestic. And right now, of course, we have a completely different kind of an emergency, and the incumbent is not prepared for this one, just as she has not been preparing us for the, for the risk of an interference from any kind of party. I am running to make sure we secure our vote, that every vote will be counted, and that if there is an event while we are conducting the elections, we figure out how to continue to do it because we have vote by mail. We have ballot drop boxes. We have free postage. We need to know that we are going to vote in August and November, despite what President Trump wants to do and despite what the Secretary of State asked our governor to do, which was to cancel these April elections that we are undertaking right now. We should never have a situation where we are canceling our right to exercise our right to vote in this unique American democracy. And that's why I'm in the game. 
Terrific. And I have some very specific questions for you uh, coming about uh, election security and the like. I will just ask you, for people who may not be familiar, give us a layperson's definition of what the Secretary of State does. Uh, great question. The Secretary of State actually oversees the elections. The election schedules are established by the state legislature and approved into law each year. The Secretary of State oversees the process, the the posting of the votes that are processed by every single local auditor or some counties call them elections officials. There are 39 of them. They each run their own operations. Uh, they are funded primarily at the local level by the counties. A uh, piece of legislation I got passed this year with overwhelming bipartisan support and signed into law by the governor for the first time in decades will actually have the state funding the state and federal elections for the local jurisdictions, which should free up some funding for them to do much more voter education and awareness to help people know where they can vote and why they should vote. Great. Well, I want to circle back to all of that, but for right now, I'm going to switch over to Representative Pelichotti and give him an, an opportunity to introduce himself. As I said in the introduction, uh, he is representative for the 30th Legislative District. He is a Fulbright scholar who has worked as a King County Deputy Prosecuting Attorney and also as an Assistant Attorney General here in the state. Uh, so, Representative Pelichotti, uh, just tell us a little bit more about your background and why it's led you to run for treasurer. Sure. Well, well, thank you again, to, uh, Stefan, for, for having me. And, and it's a pleasure to join Gail today. And, you know, Gail's been such a great leader uh, in, in, in our caucus and in the legislature. So it's, it's a real pleasure to be with her today as well. Um, and obviously, thank you to, to everyone with uh, Indivisible and all the Indivisibles uh, around the state who are, who are joining us uh, today. Um, you know, you know I'll, I'll start with the fact that, you know, you were mentioning about you know, some of my background uh, related to, you know, working as Assistant Attorney General and a lot of issues along those lines, but you know, my original background, you mentioned my Fulbright scholarship was in economic development. And it was really a focus on uh, really sustainable economic development and making sure uh, that, especially in challenging economic times, we, we address um, ways to, to really develop the, the economies that best work for everyone. Um, you, know, you know, I've got my background, my bachelor's degree in business administration. Um, those summers I spent uh, all the interns I spent interns I spent at that time were in uh, finance and doing uh, stock conversions um, and and issues like that and and you know I ended up getting my law degree later and you know prosecuted a range of cases including economic crimes at the King County Prosecutor's Office and eventually joined the Attorney General's Office um, where I managed uh, our state's efforts to combat uh, corporate healthcare fraud and dealt with a range of issues around uh, corporate uh, the way corporate structures were set up and crimes in nursing homes, for example, and making sure that um, corporate structures and financial fraud wasn't occurring in a way that was really detrimental to, to seniors. And so a lot of my background before joining the legislature was on you know, issues along those lines, which is um, you know, one of the reasons when I first ran for office in 2016, I actually ran against a multi-term Republican incumbent. Um, and uh, it, was, it, was, it was a tough race. I mean, it ended up being a million dollar race between the both sides because by beating that multi-term Republican incumbent, we held on to the House of Representatives. The Democrats held on to the majority of the House of Representatives by one vote in 2016. Um, and then when, we, when the Democrats uh, won in the Senate, when Mockadinger won in the Senate, uh, that following year, we ended up uh, having a majority in the legislature. Um, and so, uh, you know, I'm no stranger to taking on uh, Republican incumbents, and now I'm taking on a Trump-supporting Republican incumbent, somebody who has uh, publicly stated uh, his uh, support in the past uh, for Donald Trump uh, is continuing to, to restate his support for Donald Trump. And, and usually when I bring that up to people um, related to uh, the, the fact of our Trump supporting Republican incumbent treasurer, people don't even know that they, they have a, a, who the treasurer is, let alone it's a Trump, uh, Trump supporter. Um, and so it, I think it's really important that we, we change politics and, and not just that position, but one of the first things, and I'll wrap up with this, is when I first ran in 2016, um, you know, I did something that no one else was doing at the time, which is you know, I rejected all corporate donations. Um, and it's something that I think has been uh, really critical in terms of uh, allowing me to lead on a lot of issues that I, I care very much about. And hopefully we can talk a little bit about some of the issues I've done with finance yeah. and our campaign system. Um, but, it, it, you know, it's, it, it's, you know, one of the things that I think there is no position in state government where it is more critical to not have corporate campaign donations entanglements 
than the position of state treasurer that is responsible either directly or indirectly for investing over $120 billion of our money, often in corporations. And so that's and we will, and we'll definitely about. talk about why. And, and since you have brought that up, uh, I will ask you uh, this, the, the flip of what I asked Representative Tarleton, which is for you to give us just a, a working definition of what the state treasurer does. Sure. Well, the, it's multifaceted. It's actually in our constitution. It's, it's, it's a rather broad description. It's essentially, uh, essentially indicates you have to do what the legislature says. And, and other than that, it's, it's not nearly as, as, as limited as some other statewide positions. Um, but the legislature obviously has directed uh, some very important uh, uh, technical aspects of the office in which we have, you know, a range of career uh, employees who do a, a lot of important work in terms of moving the money, making sure money's moving among various agencies. And, and, you know, very, very important critical work with that. Uh, but, you know, one of the things that the office has, has done previous to our Trump supporting Republican incumbent is uh, previous to, to the incumbent, uh, the, the Treasurer serves as, as the chair of the State Investment Board. And part of that role is making sure that um, given our ownership stake in various uh, corporate interests, or I should say our stock ownership in various corporations uh, around the country, uh, be a voice for the state of Washington and making sure that the long-term interests uh, yeah. that the state has in those investments uh, is being met and not, not just short-term gain. And you know, part of that is teaming up with other like-minded states to, uh, to make sure we're advancing policies that are truly in, in, in the, the, the long-term interest of that, that, that investment. That is definitely something that I'm going to want to get into depth with you on uh, in just a moment. I'm going to shift back to Representative Tarleton for uh, our first block of questions. I'd like to start where you left off, which was around the issue of election security. Election analysts are anticipating that domestic and foreign actors are already trying to tamper with the 2020 election. Voting by mail is considered safer than, say, touch screens, but there are still vulnerabilities um, within the, the chain. And I'm, I'm curious what steps you would take to ensure the integrity of our voting in the state. Excellent. And I, I want to uh, just sort of piggyback on what Representative Pellicciotti just said about uh, how critical it is right now to have someone looking out for the long-term interests of the state in the treasurer's office, as well as in the secretary of state's office. You know, this state has the opportunity to be a leader in changing the way the nation views the responsibility of conducting elections and protecting the elections, the essential public service of conducting elections. We tend to take it for granted. And that's one of the reasons why you can have security risks because we are not taking total focus on how we protect those parts that are vulnerable. So let's break it down a little bit, Stefan. Uh, we have vote by mail, so we fill out our ballots. But everything about the processing of the ballots and the storing of the data and the vote count and the voter files are all riding in the cloud. They're not on the ground. They're not in a manual processing. They're all riding in the cloud. Those digital networks, whether we're sharing information by email or by moving it into a, uh, a database that is held at the Secretary of State's office, all of those infrastructure pieces are potentially targets of attack. And oh, by the way, we were warned in 2016 that we were under persistent attack by the Russians trying to interfere in our state's voter networks. Local auditors, local equipment at local facilities are frequently the most easily targeted because they have disparate very inconsistent terms of security practices and procedures. And it's not that any county is opening up the door, it's that they might not have the people, they might not have the funding to have the top-notch security uh, work done, they might not have a training and providing of training and exercising from the Secretary of State's office, which she has not done sufficiently. So I focus on where are the vulnerabilities? What's the critical node in the system that are potentially vulnerable to attack? And we should all remember that in 2016, the Russians exposed and attacked the DNC's email system, okay? Their voter data, every kind of information that was in there, it was exposed and attacked and hacked and then used at appropriate and most inconvenient and difficult times for our election. So we were just notified up by the New York Times today that in fact, the Republican review of the Russian interference reports from the US intelligence community in 2016 were not politically motivated 
And they were absolutely correct. The Russians were trying to interfere in 2016, and they are still doing it today. They did it in the 2018 elections, and they are still at it today. So we cannot take for granted that our Secretary of State, who stood by and watched and did not do anything about this, I, for three years, worked to pass legislation to make sure that we will be protected and working with our federal and local partners in the event we are attacked during this election cycle. But our Secretary of State will not denounce Donald Trump's call for foreign parties to interfere in our elections. They, she will not denounce Donald Trump and the other Republican secretaries of state objections to and attacks on vote by mail. Why won't she do that? I don't know, but I do know this. I would not tolerate that from a secretary of state. We must have the ability to deal with the potential risk. I've been doing that most of my career and I will not stop doing it. We got that legislation passed this year with overwhelming bipartisan support because Everybody wants the vote of their people, their constituents, everybody wants our vote to count, regardless of the party that we cast it for. And uh, just sort of dovetailing on that, I, I will shift over a little bit and talk about the primary ballot. Uh, this was a subject of a bit of contention, uh, the 2020 presidential primary yes. ballot, which required declaring party affiliation on the outside of the ballot. Um, I would love for you to explain briefly why that was required and if you would have done uh, things the same way or if you would have done things differently? Uh, great question. Uh, boy, doesn't it seem like the presidential primary was eons ago. Years uh, ago, I know. We were, <laughs> we were in the process of learning about COVID. We had lost some people to the crisis uh, and we were still conducting our election. And shortly after the ballots went out, our Secretary of State announced that she was not going to vote in the primary because she didn't want to declare her party preference on the outside of the ballot. And, uh, and then several days later, she changed her mind and said, I am going to vote in the primary, but I'm not going to declare my party preference, so my vote will be invalid. Number one, no Secretary of State should ever announce that they are not going to vote. <laughs> and number two, no Secretary of State should ever say, I'm going to vote, but I know my vote won't count. I can't even believe that that happened, but it did. What I did as a legislator is I went back and read the legislation that Representative Pellicciotti and I and many others voted on uh, to establish the presidential primary in 2019. And that was Senate Bill 5273. I wanted to know if the legislature had told the Secretary of State to put the party declaration on the outside of the ballot. We did not. We gave her the rulemaking authority to determine the location of the party preference declaration. And she determined to put it on the outside of the ballot. Now, she may have done that for efficiency reasons. She may have done that for any number of reasons, but it was somewhat disingenuous to claim that she didn't want to mark her party preference because it was on the outside of the ballot. What I would have done and I talked to a number of auditors about this, about why she didn't do this. She never asked her auditors about their opinions and ideas for how to design the ballot for the first presidential primary that would actually count towards determining the number of delegates for our nominees. I would have asked the auditors what their recommendations were. I got several recommendations just by doing that. We could have put it on the inside flap of the outside ballot. We could have put it on the actual ballot itself in order to allow it to be aligned with the Democratic list, slate of candidates and the Republican slate of candidates. That was an option. There was one final mistake that she made, which I, I have been trying to tell people over and over again. This is only a party preference declaration for this ballot, for this presidential primary, once every four years. It is not going to be on their ballot in October. August or November, but she has not educated the voters. She has not helped the local auditors educate the voters. And so many voters didn't vote and they don't even think that they're going to vote in August or November because they think they're going to have to declare their party preference. That's what I mean about a champion in the Secretary of State's office versus someone who is staying silent when it's convenient for her purposes. And so just to be clear, you would, you would do things differently. Would you put the, the party affiliation on the inside of the ballot, say? I would, 
I would use the rulemaking power that the legislature gave to the Secretary of State and say to the auditors, what are our options to allow you to effectively process the ballots with the voter signatures on the, on the, on the envelope? A lot of people have actually recommended we move the signatures into the inside of the, uh, of the inside flap of the ballot as well, because they're getting concerned about signatures being scanned by unauthorized users. And so we need a whole different approach to the security of the signature, as well as ensuring that the local auditors can do the vote processing and know that the ballot they're processing is for the nominee of that Democratic slate or right. Republican slate that they have articulated. I want to ask you very briefly about voter turnout. Um, particularly among youth and minority voters. Um, in terms of large numbers, in the 2016 general, we had a 60% turnout rate, which isn't bad. Uh, 2018's midterm, we had 53% turnout, which is pretty good for a midterm. But I'm wondering overall what you would do to increase voter turnout, and particularly increase voter turnout uh, among uh, youth and minority voters. You know, every time I uh, think about what we settle for, 58%, 60%, 62%. I think to myself, what about the 40% whose voice aren't, voices aren't being heard? What about the 40% who don't even know how to exercise their right to vote? They don't understand our vote by mail process. They don't know same day voter registration. They don't know automatic voter registration. They don't know about free postage because the legislature passed all of that in 2018 when as Representative Pellicciotti said, here we were in the finally in the situation where the Senate Democrats were in the majority and for legislation we'd been voting on for four or five years was getting stalled in the Senate. We finally got it into law in 2018. And none of the voters who are new to this state, especially youth, especially people of color who are in communities that have been disenfranchised in every other state, they don't know how well we have positioned them to be able to vote. And so I'm not satisfied with voter turnout rates of 60, 50, 52 sure. percent. I want young voters and communities that have been disproportionately and, and consistently disenfranchised to say, I want you to know why exercising your right to vote matters more than anything else in the way you have a say in this world. I, it's like the census. We need 99.9% .9 participation in the census because that is the only way every resident in Washington state will have their needs and their, their, their choices and their future supported. We should be working towards as much voter turnout as we possibly can convince people to, to say, I want a voice in how my state is run. I want a voice in how my city is run. And we don't have that kind of advocacy yet. I tried to get funding for voter education and voter outreach into my election funding bill this year. The state Senate stripped it out because they were concerned about committing uh, to too much funding in the future. I'm telling you, there is not any chance we will have strong participation by disenfranchised communities unless we fund really serious voter education and participation. Thank you for that. Uh, I, Representative Pellicciotti, I'm going to shift over to you uh, for a block of questions now. Um, and I want to start with your uh, background uh, as, a, as a legislator and also as a prosecutor. I mentioned that you, you work to pass campaign finance reform laws. You have fought against dark money and corporate influence. Uh, you also packed, uh, you passed something called the Corporate Crime Act. How would all of that inform your work as treasurer? Sure. Well, thank you. Thank you for that question. You know, as I was mentioning earlier, you know, one of the things that drove me to run for office in the first place and, and drives me today is, is, is getting corporate campaign donations out of politics um, and making it so that the voice of the people and, and associations of people are, are heard um, more in politics. So a lot of the, the fact that I've been free of those corporate donations have allowed for me to, to lead on a lot of the bills you talked about. Corporate Crime Act, which um, really came out of the fact that you know I've been uh, prosecuting uh, financial crimes and knew that the uh, penalties against corporations that commit crimes in our state had not been increased in nearly a century since 1924. I always would point that out to people that if if a corporation committed the exact same criminal offense that any one of us did or any of your loved ones did, 
your loved ones would be looking at up to life in prison without the possibility of parole for committing a class A felony. But if a corporation committed that exact same class A felony, the same victimization, uh, prior to my corporate crime act that, that Representative uh, Tarleton was a big supporter of as well, um, the, the penalty was $10,000. That was the maximum penalty, was $10,000 a judge could impose against that entity. And, and it was past time to modernize the corporate structure or the way the, the laws were written to hold corporations accountable. And ultimately, obviously, the penalty as well. But a lot of the campaign finance work that you mentioned, my uh, bill uh, you know, that, that I introduced in the House and passed into law to get dark money out of politics, my PAC transparency bill, so that for the first time, you can't just have friendly sounding uh, names on a, a mailer that you get in the mail and not know who the actual donors to that uh, ad are. Now under my PAC transparency bill, it will actually indicate that the top donors relate to that bill. And the bill that I uh, introduced uh, with Senator Solomon and passed into law just this last session to uh, ban foreign corporate donations to our political campaigns here in the state of Washington. Um, and there's been so little enforcement on the federal side that it was, it was past time to, uh, to pass our own law here in Washington and step forward and do what we needed to do related to that. And, and all of this matters because the way a lot of these issues are, are set up, um, you know, the, these, the, the way money moves matters a lot. And in other states, you have state treasurers leading on a lot of these campaign finance issues as well. So let me give you an example. In Pennsylvania, the Pennsylvania state treasurer has a transparency portal uh, that, that he has used to um, make it so that anytime a state contract is uh, given out, uh, it is put on the website that that state contract was given out to, to an entity, let's say it's a corporate entity, and it will list every politician that that corporation donated to on the website related to that state contract. And the idea, of course, being that it, it will uh, greatly, um, it, it, it'll make an elected official question whether they want to accept certain money, um, you know, if they're going to be involved in issuing something related to state contract. So, so, you know, I think there's a lot of opportunity to advance things that have not been traditionally uh, done and certainly aren't being done by our Trump supporting Republican incumbent um, that will really make, uh, really make a big difference. You know, related to that, I would also like to ask about investment of public funds, because I think that's another area where uh, having a strong progressive in position of treasurer could really make a difference, um, because it's seen as signaling a state's values. Um, what are our public funds invested in right now, and what would you specifically change in the office? Sure. Well, you know, I was pointing out with, with our, our uh, incumbent treasurer, uh, you know, he has been in the past for treasurer uh, funded by the gun lobby. He's been funded by big tobacco. He's been funded uh, by big banks. Uh, even when all the information, right at the moment, all the information was coming out about the dangers of vaping, he accepted money from the vaping industry. Um, and what we need is when we do investments, um, that, that you're, you should know that your treasurer has clean hands in, in being a part of that investment process. Now, a lot of our investments uh, are, are done through a state investment board, for example. Um, and so, you know, especially uh, if I were to serve uh, as chair of the state investment board, um, you know, it's particularly important, I think, uh, that, that uh, the treasurer have, have clean hands. So right now, for example, under the treasurer's watch, um, you, know, you know, he on the state investment board has supported uh, through support of index funds, investment in a range of industries that I think would really uh, shock people, right? You know, investment in the things like uh, firearm manufacturers, over $4 million in firearm manufacturers. Um, you know, and I think that, the, but the bigger question is less about um, just figuring out what specific things to, to invest in. Um, I, what's more important to me is you, when you have a treasurer, the treasurer is not going to stand up when he stand up to an energy company, for example, if they take money from energies, energy companies. And you know, part of stepping up to a company is, is truly holding that company uh, uh, accountable for the long-term interests of that company. And let me give you another example of that. Is you know, when, we, when I was talking about energy companies, it is in the long-term interest of a lot of these companies to uh, invest at a much quicker rate into renewables. It might not be in the short-term financial return, but in the long-term viability of that company, it is absolutely, if they are going to survive as we change our policies over the next 10, 20, 30 to 50 years, that they move into renewables at a much quicker rate. And one of the challenges that, that exists right now, it's one of the challenges in business, is just focus on the short-term return that boards have to increase stock prices a small amount or for leaders of companies to then, after a year or two, move on to another company. 
and show that they increase their stock price a marginal amount, even though in the long term, it's not in the long term interest of that company. Well, because we own uh, stock in a lot of these corporations, we can do what's called shareholder engagement. And what that means is we can team up with other like-minded states, states like Oregon, California, uh, New Jersey, Maryland, New York, and, and collectively, we actually own a significant share with these public dollars in, some, in many companies around the country. And we can go in to boardrooms and boardrooms that most certainly have a fiduciary responsibility to their shareholders, but they could ignore the protesters outside all, all they want. They can ignore, frankly, they, you know, unless a law is passed, they can ignore um, policymakers. People like but you have a, a, a controlling them. interest is what you're saying. Right. So we, you, you know, but when, when the individual um, states can come forward collectively, we have a long-term interest in the viability of that company and that, and that the company exists for a long time. And let me give you another example. We can go uh, collectively, and this is something I'm going to do as treasurer, and say we expect that the boards of the top, uh, the S&P 1500 companies better reflect the pension holders that we represent. And that means going to companies that right now nationwide have less than 30% of the board members are women, about a little over 3% are women of color. And we can go, because we know diversity is good for business, and it's certainly for the long-term interest of that company to have a diverse perspective on its board. Um, one of the things I'm going to do is I'm going to say, um, we are not going to support any slates of investors, uh, I'm sorry, any slates of board members that do not have at least 30% women. Sure. We will not, I, I will not vote for them as, as, uh, if I'm chair of the state investment board. And I'm going to team up with other like-minded states to promote those same interests. And we are going to bring about very systemic change in a very major way that is good for our investments. It's good for our business, um, but uh, uh, the long-term business. And that's something that, that our Trump supporting Republican incumbent, uh, just as you might imagine, it's not a part of right now. <laughs> I just have uh, one more question uh, for you that, that I have prepared, and then I'm seeing just a ton of tremendous questions coming in from listeners, and so we will we will uh, uh, make haste to get to as many of your questions as, as we possibly can. I just will ask you, uh, in response to coronavirus, the legislature, uh, the last session, passed uh, $200 million in rainy day funds. We know or we suspect that we're going to need a lot more money down the line uh, to help out people and communities on a number of fronts. Where will these funds come from and what does the treasurer, what could the treasurer do to make them more readily available? Sure. Well, I know this is something that Gail obviously uh, has been a great, uh, you know, great leader on through her work in the finance committee. But, you know, we have about, uh, about $3.6 billion in, in rainy day funds and reserves, a little less than that now in money that we've spent. And um, it, it's something that's critical that, that we, we have as much in reserves, I think, as, as, as we can. It's one of the things that I've promoted as, as, uh, as a legislator and, and something that, that I advocated for even in this last cycle in terms of uh, our most recent budget, uh, that the final budget uh, have, have more, more in reserves than what was originally proposed. Um, but what I think is ultimately critical is you need a treasurer who has the ear, I'm sorry, you need a, uh, a treasurer that has the ear of the legislature. You need a treasurer who has the ear of the legislature. And it, that, that right now is not the case. Um, I, I don't know many Frankly, many of my colleagues in the legislature who even know who our state treasurer is, uh, you know, he is not uh, in, in any way uh, influential in bringing about, I think, um, in being heard on, on what are very critical issues to make sure that we, we address a lot of these issues as we, we, we deal with, uh, especially the issues going forward as we deal with these issues, issues around the pandemic. Yeah. Well, thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Representative uh, Pelichati. Thank you so much, Representative Tarleton. Um, and I think we're going to dive into some listener questions right now. And the one that I am seeing that is absolutely uh, popping through right now has to do with uh, ranked choice voting, particularly as it may help to resolve voter participation issues. Uh, Representative Tarleton, I wonder if you could speak to that. Uh, thanks so much for the question. And I uh, uh, really appreciate it. This question is coming up as I talk to uh, voters and uh, and just everyone around the state right now, uh, either via Zoom or on the phone. I uh, was a supporter of the legislation that was introduced in the House this year uh, to look at uh, pilot projects in a couple of counties to allow ranked choice voting. Uh, we are trying desperately to find ways for candidates to want to run for office and for voters 
to perceive that there are choices, that when they, when they vote, they have some choices on the ballot, and that um, maybe if their first choice doesn't get through, that uh, there might be a way for them to at least acknowledge that they would be willing to support another candidate. Um, right, and I should actually just kind of hop in very briefly yeah. and just say what ranked choice voting is. For yeah, go right ahead. No. Yeah, yeah you, you, you essentially select your maybe top five uh, choices on a ballot, and that means that the person who receives the plurality of all of the votes, not necessarily the person who gets the, 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 the most number one votes, uh, is the person who advances. I right. think I'm getting that right. Is that is that roughly it? Uh, yeah. Well, there are different systems um, being mm -hmm. used uh, in different parts of the country today, but uh, that's basically the model uh, that was looked at in this legislation. And uh, we were going to do it. We would have proposed it as a pilot project. I very much want to have different local jurisdictions experiment with different kinds of voting because here in Seattle, we don't have a problem getting a lot of candidates on a ballot and we don't have a lot of problem with voter turnout. But that is not true consistently. Even, even in Mike's uh, district, there might be a difference of uh, voter turnout in the local elections and, and it's all because there aren't enough choices on the ballot. Um, that legislation did not get out of committee this year so we tried to get a budget proviso into the budget um, at Endgame, and uh, that budget proviso was not adopted by the appropriations chair and the committee, but I, I made a case for it, and I just said, listen, we need to experiment with ways in which we take, we take a look at why are voters who are given every access we can think of, same day registration, as I said, pre-registration of 16 and 17 year olds, uh, free postage, ballot boxes. Right. Why are voters not turning out in higher numbers? Is this one of the reasons? And I think we need to examine it. So I have recommended to the uh, advocates and the activists that we come back next year with some legislation. And as Secretary of State, I would support experimenting with a ranked choice voting system in some different elections, maybe in some local elections in counties where voter turnout has not been able to move the needle. We haven't been able to get the needle to move and maybe that's one of the ways we can do it. I don't view anything as the answer. I view all of these options for finding ways to connect to voters as choices we must experiment with. We are a great American experiment. We try really hard to figure out what comes next. I love the work that Mike has done on calling out dark money in politics because we can't end Citizens United by ourselves, but we sure as heck can make money in politics a heck of a lot more transparent and hold people accountable. I'm not taking corporate money or corporate PAC money for this race either. I don't think any statewide Democratic candidate is. And it's for this very reason, until we get corporate money and corporate PAC money out of our elections and our campaigns, we will not be able to say, this is the consequence of Citizens United, we must end it. And so these are the ways the Secretary of State could be more of a voice as well. Yeah, absolutely. And as a follow up to that, somebody else asked your thoughts on publicly financed elections. Well, you know, I uh, grew up in Massachusetts and did my first voting there. And then I voted in uh, Washington, D.C. when I was in college. And then after college, I voted in Virginia. Um, all of those places had publicly financed uh, campaign options on your tax returns where you could say, I want to commit so much money to publicly financed campaigns. And um, I can't remember in here in Seattle, of course, we have democracy vouchers. And I believe deeply in supporting candidates through the democracy vouchers. Democracy vouchers and camp publicly, campaign publicly financed campaigns work really well, especially at the local level, and especially when you have campaign contribution limits. And this is a key, you have to, you need both in order to show people that no one donor or no big set of donors can buy the election. And I, I really believe deeply that the democracy vouchers have expanded the participation of the general voter who doesn't want, doesn't have the capacity to give $100 and doesn't want to give $100, has the choice to say, 
but I do want to spend my $25 of public financing on this candidate. And I, I believe deeply that every local jurisdiction should have the choice of looking at that. And we may want to look at it as a statewide ballot measure as well. I will put the same question to you, Representative Pellicciotti. Any thoughts on publicly financed elections? It's a good question. I think we saw it uh, start to play out in some Seattle elections. I think we've started to see uh, that it's worked without the, the amount of uh, concern or fraud that I think has been identified. I think, uh, you know, it's one of those things that you can't really unveil something statewide until you start seeing in kind of the incubation model how it's working in certain certain areas. We're starting to see it work in places like Seattle. And I think, uh, you know, I'd like to, I'd like to think it's the, the future. I, I really think that um, if we can get someplace where where it can be both afforded and, and, uh, and workable, where people are actually encouraged to do it. I think we've seen at the national level where it creates, creates uh, more of a challenge because too many candidates don't, don't opt into it. Um, you know, and then it kind of creates a, a, you know, an imbalance that, that makes it not workable. Um, you know, it gets more and more challenging the more expensive races get, which tends to be the case that they go from local to state to national. But yeah. I, I'm, I'm encouraged by what we, we've seen play out uh, at the city level. And I, I, I really would hope that it's the future is at the state level next. I will also direct the next question to you because we've gotten a, a bunch of questions about this. Um, Senator Hasegawa has been working toward having a state bank. Uh, is this something that you support? And if so, what specific benefits do you see for state government? Well, you know, as I pointed out before, you know, uh, never having accepted any corporate, uh, corporate money since first running for office, you know, my, my big focus is doing everything I possibly can to, to make sure that um, every action the government takes best serves the people and not corporate profits. Um, you, you know, one of the things that Senator Kuderer put forward um, last year, which, I, which uh, was a plan so that the, or I should say was a legislative proposal, so that a business plan would be created uh, to examine whether or not we could we can do this, make it viable. It's one of the things that um, it, it was first presented to the treasurer to to look at. Um, you know, he ended up not even um, doing an independent study himself on it. He ended up recycling some old reports, uh, and in recycling those old old reports, he even told on conservative talk radio later he didn't even look at whether or not uh, um, the possibility of a bank that didn't have federal insurance. Well, that's a component piece of any type of state bank would be if something could be done just as a depository institution, I'm sorry, as a lending institution instead of the depository institution. And what was really proposed by Senator Kuderer was putting together a business plan that would allow for local uh, governments to do uh, lending based on pooling their money in a way that would not risk pension dollars in any way um, and would not in any way uh, create other uh, liabilities that I think would be concerning. And that what, what is concerning to me is our state treasurer said he is going to stand strong against any, uh, anything of the sort. Um, now, he's funded by the big banks. And I think when he takes that position, um, it, it really calls into question um, whether, uh, especially when he says he didn't even look at doing just a lending model instead of a depository model, um, whether or not this was something that, that is, is most, most po possible to do. And so it's one of the things that, that when I'm treasurer, we're, we're going to make sure that the legislative interests um, that I, I don't stand in the way of the legislative uh, interest into doing a full consideration of this. So it's something that, that, that I, I look forward to being different than the, than the treasurer. Terrific. Um, the next question is for you, uh, uh, Senate, uh, uh, Representative Tarleton. Um, and it has to do with the, the U.S. Postal Service. Um, as we know, they are on the ropes right now. Uh, some reports say that they won't be able to last through the summer. Um, and I think we're wondering what would happen to our vote by mail uh, if the post office ceases to be. Did you have a contingency plan for that? So, uh, Stefan, so glad for that question, whoever asked it. I am, uh, I want to reflect back on something that Mike just said, which is really important. We incubate new ideas and experiment at the local level before we go statewide. We do the same thing at the state level before we go nationwide. Right. Our Secretary of State has been in that office for eight, seven and a half years. She got elected to the, the Secretary of State's office at the same year I got elected to the legislature. She could have been an advocate for vote by mail. She could have been a champion. We could have been a leader na nationally to make sure that other states were adopting vote by mail a heck of a lot sooner than the 2020 election in the middle of a pandemic. But no, she did not do that. Why she didn't do it, 
I don't know, but I do know this. There are 29 Republican secretaries of state nationally. Vote by mail has never been one of the Republican mantras. They have never really been an advocate for expanding voter access. They've done everything they could to suppress and disenfranchise voters around this country. We have not had that in Washington state because democratically controlled majorities in the House and in the governor's office have forced on our Republican leaders in the Senate legislation that expands voter access. So how do we protect vote by mail in this state? We've already got, and, and nationally, there is actually a national vote by mail option today in every state, and that's called absentee voting. Every state has had it for decades to support overseas voting by military, to support civilian families who are overseas, working overseas or with their military spouses. And every state could expand statewide absentee voting. Wisconsin's governor tried to, and he was not allowed to by the Republican legislators who controlled the legislature, who had put conservative judges in positions of responsibility, and then took it to the US Supreme Court. And so my vote here, vote by mail is one way we take care of our access to voting, but ballot boxes are our backup. And I am going to commit that if we go into special session before the November election, I will fight to expand access through the ballot box just to protect against the very possibility that the president will use the excuse of an additional outbreak, a recurrence of some sort, to cancel US Postal Service participation in getting out the vote. I think this state is in a position to protect ourselves. My concern nationally is that there are not enough voices, and we should have been right on the front lines. There are not enough voices supporting Senator Klobuchar and Senator Wyden's voices with the proposal in the legislature, not only to have national vote by mail by absentee ballots, but to fund free postage of the ballots. If Can the, I just uh, jump in and just ask you how sure. you would advocate for that as Secretary of State at, at the, the national level? Oh, I, you know, the secretaries of state have an association. The secretaries of state have strong relationships with each other. Um, there's a Republican secretaries of state committee. There's a Democratic secretaries of state association. Our secretary of state was the chair of the executive committee of the Republican secretaries of state association from 2016 to 2018. She sure as heck could have advanced vote by mail. We still only have it in five states. And we've had it for over a decade. There is nothing magic about conducting vote from home through the mails. I will just remind people there are over 100,000 veterans who have a job in the Postal Service. I bet one of them is our neighbor or our friend or a family member. There are also millions of Americans who rely on the Postal Service to deliver their medications in regular situations, but specifically right now in this emergency situation. There are millions of unions, voters and, and workers in the Postal Service. This is not an attack on the Postal Service only or on public services like the Postal Service. This is an attack on union workers, on public employees and our right to be able to communicate freely and privately with whomever we want in our on our town, city, state, nation, and the world. And every single one of us should be standing up and cheering for the postal workers who are figuring out a way to keep going through this crisis. It is a real risk to all of them. Agreed. Um, I'm going to put this next question to you, uh, Representative Pellicciotti. Um, and it has to do with uh, a state income tax. And, you know, in your position as representative, that's certainly within your purview. I, I believe as treasurer, it is not. But I will just ask you generally, what, if anything, the treasurer can do to address Washington's upside down tax structure? Well, I think I think what the treasurer can do is 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 in many ways different than what the treasurer was doing to this point. I, you know, we one of the bills I put forward and co-sponsored uh, a couple of years ago was uh, with the help of, of Representative Tarleton was to have property tax, um, returning, uh, lowering our property tax rates. Um, and it, it's something that was specifically uh, opposed uh, by our state treasurer and the state treasurer who four years earlier had said that he would in no way engage in 
any policy making aspect related to these revenue sources uh, turned around and then on an issue like capital gains, um, we, you know, we, which, which is something that, that is viable. He specifically said that he would not, um, uh, that, that he was gonna aggressively oppose it. So you know, where we have a, a areas where we can actually deal with the regressive tax system, we, you know, we have a treasurer who's got it flipped around. We have an upside down tax system for a reason and he's, he's further keeping it upside down in the way he's advocating. And so I, I think that, you, you know, as you noted, a lot of the other issues you talked about are, are tied up in, and are currently unconstitutional in the courts, but for that which is not, we need to be making sure we're doing everything we can to take the burden off of working families um, and retired folks. I, I think it's it, time and time again, you know, the, the kind of corporate tax breaks get, get the, the, the free pass. And um, it's something that, that fundamentally needs to change. And, you know, when, I, when I'm running against someone who's, who's, you know, funded by these kind of, these corporate PACs, um, you're not gonna see that type of, type of uh, critique coming, coming from him. That's, that's something that, that I think will be different when I'm treasurer. I will actually just ask you both a, a very general question about that um, because you are uh, both running, uh, you know, you're not accepting any corporate money and Representative Pellicciotti, I imagine it's very challenging running as an anti-corporate candidate. Not only do you not accept corporate donations, but corporations uh, will likely be funding your opponent. How do you meet that challenge? Is it a question to me first? Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, oh. let's, go to, let's, go, <laughs> let's go with you first. And then, and then certainly I will put that question to Representative Charlton as well. Oh, okay. Well, I, 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 I don't mean to skip ahead if I, I, I didn't hear if it was for me or not, but uh, yeah, look, I mean, it's, I think it's a, it's a challenge for both of us. You, you know, when I first ran in 2016 um, against, uh, you know, multi-term Republican incumbent, uh, nobody thought I could win, um, you know, and especially, you know, back in 2016, not many folks were, were talking about getting, getting corporate money out of, out of politics. And, uh, but what I did is I knocked on 15,000 doors, personally, uh, talked to folks, figured out what issues were important to folks and, and, and won that election and won again against that, that same representative uh, uh, two years later by um, over 22 points. And, you know, I think it's the same with, with a race like this. People, people want to make sure their, their treasurer is making decisions, has clean hands when they're making very critical decisions. And we see that time and time again, that there's an interplay taking place between the law and finance. Uh, you know, you hear that from Rep Congresswoman Porter in California, you hear that from people like Elizabeth Senator Warren. Yeah. Um, and, 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 for some reason, we're kind of slow to appreciate that here in Washington State, even though it's it, other states around the country recognize that. And so, I think that's something I'm, I'm looking forward to, to to working hard on. But you know, I've already campaigned in uh, in nearly half of our 39 counties. It's a little more challenging now, but I'm doing it digitally, and uh, I'm going to keep uh, keep getting the message out. And yeah, I will absolutely put the same question to you, uh, Representative Tarleton. Um, how are you uh, funding your campaign uh, when you are uh, not accepting corporate donations? Well, I'm uh, calling individuals, uh, cold calling individuals all over the state, uh, making sure that I have an opportunity to get the message out myself. I'm using uh, what we call digital volunteers, uh, people who want to sign up to get a specifically uh, prepared campaign message from my team uh, once a week. And we're asking that network of digital volunteers to send it out to their network of individuals, uh, family members, friends, colleagues, uh, former colleagues, maybe former family members uh, who are Washington voters uh, to get the word out that I can't be on the ground, but I am campaigning in the cloud with all of them. And I, like, like Mike, uh, a little bit longer before, my first race for office was against a two-term uh, incumbent court commissioner at the Port of Seattle. He was known as a Republican. He had also served two terms on the Renton City Council. He was definitely a big business kind of guy, uh, worked at Boeing, and uh, was very well liked. Uh, had a relatively nondescript term of uh, two terms in the Port Commission until he was president when uh, there was a uh, an effort made to give the retiring uh, Port Commission, the Port Executive, a uh, golden parachute of $339,000 as a going away present. And that happened to be revealed in 2007. I ran that race King County wide. I had never been involved in politics before. I won the endorsements of 16 of the 17 King County Democratic mm -hmm. districts. And I won the a six way primary by five, almost five points. And I won the general election by nine points. Uh, I think nine and a half points. I beat the incumbent in the general election. 
And I raised more than $300,000 virtually all by individual donors. Wow. Okay. So I know how to run this kind of a race, just like Mike does. Um, and it's going to require a whole bunch of us to be doing things differently, but I am not afraid to do it. If there was ever a year where we, when 600,000 Washingtonians have lost their jobs in a five week period, this is the year we prove to people going face to face, whether it's through Zoom or through Google chat or whatever we do, that that is the way people knowing people who trust people are gonna get us elected because people want to vote for people they can trust. And the only people they can trust right now are people they already know. So yeah. having this town hall, Stefan, has been a fantastic opportunity to reach a lot of you around the state who otherwise would be seeing us both in person, hopefully together in person as many times as possible. Mike and I were hoping that would happen. And, uh, and this is the next best thing, okay? <laughs> Well, we're so grateful to, uh, that, that you were able to, to join us for this, and uh, it's just been uh, tremendously informative. Unfortunately, we are, we are out of time. I just want to ask both of you very briefly, uh, just if you could just, uh, kind of sum it up in maybe 30 seconds, what kind of help you need uh, from Indivisible members and listeners, and where can people learn more? Uh, Rep Representative Pellichotti, uh, we'll start with you. Well, thank, thanks again, uh, Stefan, and, and to everyone with Indivisible for putting this on. It's a great way to talk about these races. You know, four years ago, um, I don't know if everyone remembers, there were actually five candidates who ran for state treasurer. It was an open seat, three Democrats and two Republicans. The Democrats split the vote, and so the two Republicans went on to the general election. So you had to pick between two Republicans uh, in 2016, and, and guess what? You got a Trump-supporting Republican incumbent out of it uh, that no one knows who, who he is. Uh, what, what's going to happen, uh, you know, when I'm elected is, you know, four years from now, you won't be asking, uh, what does the state treasurer do? Um, we're going to be making sure we're best serving the interests of the people. And if you want to support this campaign, just go to electmikep.com, electmikep.com. Obviously, rely on people and associations of people to support our campaign. And so it'd be great to have your support. I like the sound of everything that you just said. Yeah, it would be wonderful <laughs> if, if we didn't have to explain who the, the, the treasurer is and, and, and what he does. We could just say it's, it's Mike Pellicciotti and, and that's all you need to know. Uh, so Representative Tarleton, you get the last word. What uh, sort of help you need and where can people learn more about your campaign? Thank you, Stefan. Uh, what you're doing today is helping the campaign. What all of you, I, I have uh, 83 now, but we had up to 90, or maybe 90 plus um, participating. Thank you all. I am Gail Tarleton. No E in the middle sounded out. It's just Tarleton. Uh, my website is Vote for Gale, V O T E F O R G A E L, because uh, my mom spelled Gale like the Gaelic. Uh, dot mm. org. <laughs> and uh, and if you want to become a digital volunteer, if you want to become a uh, a receiver of our e newsletters, if you want to donate to the campaign, uh, we have a real grassroots, people powered effort going on. Uh, keep telling people about Mike's and my name. Keep telling people about our name, uh, that we are the only Democratic candidates running against the incumbent Republicans, that the re incumbent Republicans are supporting either explicitly or by their silence. They are supporting this President Trump's constant attacks on our right to vote, our, our right to be in a free and fair election for our right to be in a free democratic society. Um, we are the Democrats running this race. I believe we will be the only two democratic challengers against these two incumbents when the filing deadline happens on May 15th. So please be there for us and uh, we'll be there for you. Thanks so much, everybody. Terrific. Well, I want to say thank you so much to both of our incredible candidates uh, for joining us tonight, Representative Mike Belichiotti and uh, Representative Gail Tarleton. And especially thanks to everybody who has, has listened and has submitted questions. I wish that we could have gotten to them all. I will just let you know that we will be sending the remaining questions on to the applicable uh, candidates and you will receive, I believe, a, a written response, which we can share. Uh, special thanks, of course, to the Washington Indivisible Network, my partner, uh, Kat Pipkin, Julie Andrzejewski, and Indivisible Tacoma, and also a special thanks to Chris Petzold. And with that, uh, back to you, Kat. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Stefan. Uh, we have just a couple more minutes of wrap up here. Uh, I'll hand it over to 
Julie Andrzejewski with Indivisible Tacoma, who's done virtually all the work to set these up. Um, Julie, do you want to take over and talk a little bit about how you can use town halls for organizing? And can I jump off you guys? I got a couple more calls to make. Thank you, Gail. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you thank all. You. Many thanks. Have a great evening and stay safe, everybody. Thanks. <clears throat> Uh, hey, Kat, Gail, you wanna, jump on. Yes, I you am. Put share. Up that share. Um, yes, it's uh, this. Uh, these town halls. We created them so that each of the indivisibles could use them as an organizing tool. Um, they are going to be recorded, and you can access the recordings. Cat uh, will uh, be posting those in places where you can access them. It will also be rebroadcast uh, through the podcast this Thursday. And both of those will be available to your, uh, to your indivisibles. So the more that you can organize in your areas to get out the word about these two amazing candidates, this is a, this is, we, indivisibles can make the difference in this campaign. We can be one of the key organizations to make this difference. So uh, if you can announce uh, future town halls, because we're gonna be doing one of these statewide town halls once a month. The next one will be with Hillary France on May 19th. Uh, we'll get that information out to you. If you can repost this town hall, the recording of this town hall on your websites and social media, that would be fabulous. Um, listen to the podcast and share the information about uh, the podcasts and uh, send them around to your allies as well. I think that uh, all the indivisibles around the state have uh, various organizations that they're working with in terms of their allies. And it's up to us. We can share this information around with all of our um, members. The, our members bring them up to speed about these two fabulous uh, candidates and our allies. So, and then the other thing is sign up to work for these candidates uh, and uh, sign up for uh, Gail's um, digital volunteering and uh, help Mike. Mike, um, I'm sure he will have some kind of plan for people to work for him as well. So thank you very much. I'm so excited about all of you that joined us tonight and I'll send it back to Kat. Thank you so much, Julie. And just once again, thank you for all your work putting these together. I just wanna make clear that we actually have a town hall every week through the end of May. If you look in the chat, I put in links for each and every one. We've got four more scheduled here in the next few weeks. I also copied in the links uh, for the candidates that you see here on screen, Mike Policiati's uh, Instagram, Facebook, handles, uh, his email, et cetera, and Gail's uh, website, email address, and how to become a digital volunteer, which actually sounds like a really fun job. Once again, uh, unless everybody has things that, if everybody wants to come back on and say good night, otherwise I will go ahead and pause the recording now and thank everybody for participating. Julie, thanks again for everything. Thank good you. Night.